The land of milk and honey. How many of you have ever heard of Israel referred to that? <coughs> the land of milk and honey. It's funny, you know, growing up as a Jew and going to synagogue for all of those years, um, you know, you hear the land of milk and honey, and, you know, it's like, what do you think of when you're a kid? You think of ice cream, milk, you think of, you know, a little honey bear, honey bottle. But when our Heavenly Father calls something a land of milk and honey, he has a reason for saying that. And today I want to talk about the land of milk and honey. I want to talk about the Jordan. I want to talk about the, the, the Jordan crossing for just a little bit. And most importantly, I pray that we become a part of the story tonight. Most ancient civilizations held their rivers to be sacred. The Nile, for instance. And uh, the Egyptians actually worshipped the Nile. And it's fascinating because I was going to just touch on this. And Brother Jim Jones had taught a class uh, last week where he was teaching how each of the plagues... Uh, that was brought against the nation of Israel, uh, nation of Egypt, the land of Egypt, was brought against one of the false gods that they worshipped. But anyway, the Nile was one of the things that they worshipped. Uh, Israel never did. They never did worship the Jordan. The Jordan was not seen as something that was sacred, but rather the Jordan was seen as a boundary, something to be crossed. You know, and then, of course, for, you know, thousands of years, believers have been talking about, you know, crossing the River Jordan. You hear that? And uh, we've written songs about it. We've talked about it. But today I want to touch on it as we talk about crossing from the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. The problem was there was the Jordan River. There was a boundary between the two. Some have the false notion that the Jordan River, they see it as the roaring Mississippi. Have you ever seen the Mississippi River? Yes. Uh, the wife and I, I mean, we've traveled over it by bridge. We've been on it by cruise ship. Um, and, you know, it's funny because people who have never, I've never been to Israel. I will confess to people that have never looked at the, the geography of the, the nation or anything else. They have these weird ideas about what places look like. They don't even realize that Jerusalem's like on top of a mountain. Mm -hmm. And... You know, the, the River Jordan is not the Mississippi River. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I want to give you a little bit of information. I know I hate that. I'm going to give you a little bit of information about the Jordan River. Then we're going to join the story tonight. This is a picture of the Jordan. Okay? You see from one side to the other. Now, where this picture was taken, when it was taken, Jordan, the Jordan River literally is one of the faster running rivers. Now, it doesn't look like so in this picture. But uh, it is a fast-running river, and that's because it's running downhill, and it's running below sea level, okay, down to the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is like 1,318 feet below sea level, okay? You may not have known that. But the Jordan River, I want you to notice how wide it is. This is about the width of the Jordan River the entire length. And if we can capture a shot of this for those who are watching by YouTube, so that they can see, this is about the width the entire Jordan River is. Now, I want to show you, and it's kind of tough to see here, but literally from uh, Mount Hermon, which is at the very top, that's where the springs are. And the springs bubble forth from Mount Hermon, and uh, they bubble all the way down for about 25 miles to the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is filled by the springs from Mount Hermon. And then, that's the River Jordan there for 25 miles. Then it gathers in the Sea of Galilee, and then on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, the River Jordan again travels this length here for the distance of another 65 miles. So it's about 90 miles in total, but with all the winding and turning, they say it's about 200 miles in length. It's like about 90 miles but then with all the back and forth and the snaking back and forth, it's about 200 miles in length. So again, I want you to see the geography of the land and to see the River Jordan and the approximate width as we get into the story here in just a moment. This again, it's just another picture of the same thing, except here you see the Dead Sea, which is, I was close, 1,368 feet below sea level. So all the way from Mount Hermon, the water comes out of these springs, bubbles all the way down, and the River Jordan does run in some places very fast, but it does not get very wide. <clears throat> now, on one side of the River Jordan, 
was wandering in desert. How many of you know Israel, we said they were in the desert for how many years? 40, 40. 40 years, okay? And each year was a year's punishment for a day that the spies went into the spy out the promised land and came back with a negative report and convinced all of Israel, except for two, Joshua and Caleb, not to go into the promised land. So they suffered for 40 years, literally, until that generation died out and a new generation came forth, one who would inherit the promises. So on one side of the Jordan was a place of wandering and desert. Have you ever been that place in your life, a place of wandering and desert? A place of dryness, a place where, you know, your Heavenly Father's meeting your needs, but it's just like you don't know what it is that he wants you to do with your life. I think that can be sometimes one of the driest places. When you're walking in faith, you're serving the Father, you're following Yeshua, but you're not sure where you're following him to. And every day is just another day, and you're praying, saying, Father, what is it that you would like me to do in your kingdom? And how many of you know he has something he wants each and every one of us to be doing in his kingdom? Amen? Amen. Something. Something. I gave Zach today, a, uh, this evening, a letter. Uh, we received a letter um, from a man in prison in one of the jails here in Abilene. And um, he had heard the um, advertisement for Tikva Lachayim. And um, he was in, interested in the Messianic movement. And so anyway, he wrote a very nice letter. So Zach has taken on the uh, 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 desire to write this man and fellowship and to encourage him in his faith while he's in prison. <coughs> Almost like a little prison ministry. And so uh, we have all have something we can be doing. Amen? Amen? I tell folks, do something unless you end up doing nothing. Our Heavenly Father has not called us to be seat taker-uppers or to be attenders. That is not the body of Messiah. The body of Messiah is living. Yeah. It's a vibrant organism, every part, fitly joined together, doing its part. But anyway, on one side was wandering in desert. On one side was the land of milk and honey. How many of you like that place? Yeah. Land of milk and honey. And I think now when I think of milk and honey, I think of milk and Oreos. <laughs> yeah. But on the other side was the land of milk and honey. Now, they called it the land of milk and honey. And the reason they called it that is because in the mountains and the hills, that's where the goats and that's where the sheep had their pastures. You know, again, we've got this Western idea of the pasture lands in Israel being for the sheep and the goats. And that's not true. That is not the case. That was the place where the farming took place. And where the farming took place, that was the land of honey. Everybody say honey. 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 Why? What attracts honeybees is plants and flowers and everything else. So the farmlands were known as the land of honey. And the hills were known as the land of milk. Because that was the place where the goats and the sheep. Matter of fact, uh, uh, in the Psalms where it says, he, uh, he leads me beside still waters, he leadeth me into what? Green pastures. pastures. Those green pastures, you know, it's funny because, you know, on Facebook sometimes you see these posts and it's got this luscious green pasture. It looks like it was taken in Nebraska or something. <laughs> and it's got this sheep in the middle of it just eating all he wants. And that's not really the right picture. The right picture is the hills of Israel and the humidity causes the grass to come up in the cracks and the crevices, I know it sounds weird, but I'm telling you the truth, and the cr cracks and the crevices of the rocks in the hills, sometimes that grass only lasts for one day before it withers up in the heat and dies. So the first thing in the morning, guess what the shepherds are out doing? Bringing their flocks up into the hills to eat those green pastures. And what's that picture tell us? It tells us that our Heavenly Father will provide enough for us for today. Yeah. He doesn't stick you in a green pasture where you can just munch to your heart's content. That is not good for our soul, guys. No. I was sharing with some people who have this desire to be rich in this life. That is not a believer's desire. A believer's desire is to be rich in the next life. Amen. Amen. Now, if you happen to be blessed with financial uh, uh, gain, don't ever, ever, ever allow that thing to penetrate into your heart because it is dangerous. And I'll tell you what, there have been many, many fine believers who have fallen by the wayside, don't even know they're falling, 
I saw this thing on all these preachers having these multi-million dollar homes. Mm -hmm. Listen, the problem's not what you have, it's what you do with what you have. Do you get that? Yes. Yes. Are we living for ourselves or are we living for him? If we're living for him, we're living for others. If we're living for others, then we're doing what we can to help others. Crossing the Jordan by the priest in Joshua's day was about being all in. Now, I love this part of the story. And we'll get to the scripture here in just a second, but I'm just setting the stage, trying to go fast. Now, I'm setting the stage for you because how many of you remember that uh, the Lord told Joshua, he said, look, you're going to cross the River Jordan, have the priests go in first, and as they do, what he said was going to happen to the River Jordan. It was going to part, just like the Red Sea parted. Now, these guys have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, listen, at the River Jordan, there is no gentle slope into the river. There's no beach, okay? You're not walking in, and you're in two inches, and then you're in five inches of water, then 10 inches. No, did you see that bank? The whole river is like that, okay? It's in a, a, a cleft that is a geographic formation between two... Uh, 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 separate mountains, mountain ranges, and goes all the way to South Africa, that cleft does. And so when you step into the River Jordan, there's no just gentle stepping about it. When you step in, you're going in the water. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're not two inches in. Now listen, can you imagine, here you are the priest, you've got the Ark of the Covenant, and Joshua says go in, because once you go in, the river's going to part. Can you imagine if you're the first priest? <laughs> you're the, hey, guy, you want to switch places? <laughs> why, why don't you go in first and then let me in? Because, listen, there was no going part in. Our Heavenly Father wants us all in. Everyone say all in. All, all in. in. When it talks about loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that means nothing held back. We live in a generation and in a culture that tries to add Yeshua to everything else that they're doing in their life, and they wonder why they're miserable and why they have no relationship with Yeshua whatsoever. It's because they're not all in. They're trying to add their little big toe to the water to see if the river parts. The priests, they didn't do that. They said, you know what? He said, go in. In we go. And once they stepped in, the river parted. Isn't it cool? Yeah. He wants us all in. This is Deuteronomy 26, 15. And again, this is from a portion of the Torah portion for this week that we did not read. It says, look out from your holy dwelling place from heaven and bless your people Israel and the land you gave us as you swore to our ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, how many of you know we don't live in Israel? One day we'll be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. But we're not there right now. And I've not made Aliyah. I've not moved there. I'm still here. So this land of milk and honey is a land where we find the presence of his Ruach, the presence of his spirit in our life. And you know what? We can find that land of milk and honey every day in our life. Someone say amen. amen. But it only happens when you cross the boundary. And that boundary is the Jordan. And that only happens when you're all in. Stop tiptoeing around in our walk and in our faith. Amen? Amen? If the thing I can get across to believers is you and I need to follow the rabbi with our whole heart, we need to be all in, nothing held back. Amen. I'm not holding back my finances. I'm not holding back my time. I'm not holding back my energy. I'm not holding back my strength. I had somebody pay me a compliment, uh, 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 a guy from, from our Wednesday night service, and he said, man, he said, whether there's five people or a hundred people, you know, you just give it your all. I'm not doing that to impress people. I'm doing that for him because I'm all in. So whether it's me, my wife, and my son, we're going to be all in. Amen? Amen. And I'm hoping to bring as many people with me who want to be all in. I am not interested in this mamby pamby religion that America's offering people. I'm interested in the way, the truth, and the life. Through Yeshua, I'm interested in people who say enough is enough. I'm going to follow him with my whole heart. I'm going all the way into the River Jordan. Yes. And you know what was funny? The father said, go into the river, then I'll part it. 
He didn't say, you know what, guys? I'm going to go easy on you. Let me go ahead and let me part the river for you first, then go ahead in. There's no faith in that, guys. And without faith, the scripture says it is impossible to please who? God. To please the Father. It's impossible to please him without faith. Faith comes when he says to do, and you do out of obedience. And when you obey, then the Jordan parts. But most of the time we hear his voice and he says to do, and we're just, well, Father, I will, but if you do this first. No, it doesn't work that way. He speaks, we listen. And once you learn to do that, then you start seeing the Ruach, then you start seeing the Holy Spirit working through your life and in your life in incredible ways. Because then you're like, yes, Lord, I'll obey. I don't understand it, but I'll obey. Walk for Israel, yes, Lord, <laughs> I'll obey. Don't understand how it's going to come about, but this is what's on my heart. We'll do it. You follow me? I'm bragging on the Spirit because he speaks to us all the time. If we would but listen. Deuteronomy 27, verse 2 and 3. When you cross the yard end to the land out of all your God has given you, you are to set up large stones, put plaster on them, and after crossing over, write this Torah on them, every word, so that you can enter the land out of all your God has given you, a land, what? Flowing, Flowing with milk and honey. It's Abinoy, your God, uh, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Aren't you glad God keeps his promises? Yes. yes. The hills were the land of milk. The farmland was the land of honey. The pastures of the flocks of goats and sheep were in the hills, except directly after harvest. Listen, the only time they came down from the hills and were allowed into the farmland was after the harvest. The farmers would allow the the, the, the shepherds to bring their flocks in and to eat the little remains because it helped to bring the soil. That's why I know for a fact Yeshua wasn't born December 25th. Oh. <laughs> Remember when the, the, who the angels appeared to guys? Shepherds. shepherds. And where were they, Jim? In the fields. Well, they weren't in the fields except after the what? Harvest. After the harvest. So that was sometime between July and August uh, or September, excuse me. July and the end of September. The farmlands were the home of the honeybees and some of the sweetest honey on the planet. Have you, have you ever had honey from Israel? Yes. How good is it? Wonderful. I bet it is. Did you bring any tonight? <laughs> well, don't tell me about it. No, I'm kidding. Deuteronomy 27, verse 5 through 7. And there thou shalt build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Now, why do you think the Heavenly Father, he wanted them to build an altar where they crossed the Jordan, just of stones, but not to have any iron tool worked on the, on the stone, and just set it up as a memorial. Verse 6, Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. And thou shalt offer peace offerings, and shalt eat there and rejoice before the Lord thy God. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Set up some rocks, you get to have a picnic, you get to eat there, and this is going to be a memorial for your generations that this is the place that you cross the Jordan on dry ground when you obey the word of the Lord. Amen. Why were they told to use rocks not hewn with iron tools? It's important. Why? Could the altar not be of stone worked by human hands? Because it symbolizes our own strength and our own might. Mm -hmm. It wasn't by our own strength or by our own might that Israel crossed the River Jordan. Amen. It was by his strength and his might. Listen to me, guys. If you don't hear anything else tonight, hear this. Stop trying to do things in your own strength, in your own might. Because all you're doing is you're taking iron tools to his altar. Amen. And what I've learned in my life, in my 33 years of serving Yeshua, is this. He'll do the most through me when I get out of the way. Mm -hmm. The less I do, the more he'll do. Now, I know that sounds really simplistic, but it's really, really, really true. 
Because in our lives, how many times do we try to do something for the Father and then we're asking Him to bless it? Instead of finding out what He wants us to do and then guess what? It's already blessed. It was not human endeavor that brought Israel to the land of milk and honey. Who brought Israel to the land of milk and honey? Our Heavenly Father. So how do we join the story? We're always talking about joining the story. It's pretty simple. We join the story because we recognize where you and I are at in our walk with Yeshua today was not by human effort. Now, that doesn't mean we have no responsibility. That does not mean that we have no accountability. I'm not talking about that. But just recognize that it wasn't by human effort that you are right here in this spot today, but by his spirit and by his grace and by his mercy. If that doesn't keep you thankful, nothing will. The older I get, the more thankful I feel myself becoming, which is, you know, it's weird. Why? Because I'm recognizing none of this is of my own doing, but of his doing. I'm, and I'm not talking about ministry stuff. I'm talking about none of this being his grace and his work in my heart. You see, you'll never do ministry stuff until you stop trying to do stuff and allow his spirit to do in you and to form Yeshua in you. Remember, Messiah in us, Moshiach in us, the hope of what? Glory. The hope of glory. Amen? Amen? Human striving and human endeavor does not bring us to our place of fruitfulness in our life. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2 through 6. For we have heard the good news, just as they did. They heard the message, but it did them no good. Why? Now, let's talk about unbelieving Israel. Why did it do them no good? Because when they heard it, they did not accept it with faith. Verse 3, we who believe then do receive that rest which God promised. It just as he said, I was angry and made a solemn promise. They will never enter the land where I would have given them rest. He said this even though his work had been finished from the time he created the world. When did Israel enter their rest? Now I'm speaking now of entering the rest from the wilderness was when they crossed the river what? When they crossed the Jordan. They entered into the promised land. This was the place of promise. There is a rest that belongs to the people of God. And the Shabbat is but a, 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 a picture, a, a snapshot, an Instagram, if you would, of that rest that belongs to the people of God from self-striving and self-seeking. It's not about me, it's about Him. Amen. It's about His work in me, His work in you, His work in people. Amen? When we make the story not about Him, but about us, we get away from the story and become something that no longer looks and smells like the good news that Yeshua delivered but become something that's selfish, self-serving, self-purposed. Hebrews 4, verses 2 through 6, where somewhere in the scripture this is said about the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day from all of his work. Now, did God start work on the eighth day? Now, you've never thought about this. Don't answer, but think about this. How many days were the days of creation? Six. Hello? Six. Six. And the seventh day, he what? Rested. Is he still resting? Did he start building something? Is there an eighth day I don't know about? <laughs> the seventh day, he's still resting. Strive to enter into his what? Rest. His rest. Now, this same matter, verse 5, is spoken of again. They will never enter that land where I would have given them rest. <laughs> Those who first heard the good news did not receive that rest because they did not what? Believe. Did not believe. There are then others who are allowed to receive it. Listen to me. The biggest thing that keeps the people and the children of God from crossing the Jordan of their life into the land of milk and honey is doubt and unbelief. Mm -hmm. Doubt and unbelief. We struggle. It's amazing. God's such a big God for somebody else's problems. For somebody else's ailment and somebody else's sickness. But when it's my sickness, my problem, my ailment, all of a sudden I can't seem to wrap my faith around it. Am I the only one or have you ever dealt with that too? Yes. 
It's easy to pray for others, but praying for yourself and believing the Father for your life to work in your heart or to use you to reach other people. Hebrews 4, 10 through 11. For those who receive that rest which God promised will rest from their own work. Everybody say own work. Own work. Just as God rested from his. Let us then do our best to receive that rest so that no one of us will fail as they did because of their what? Lack, Lack of, faith. of faith. Lack of faith. Do you understand the gist of what this is saying now? And I'm relaying it into to, to the River Jordan and to crossing over into the land of milk and honey because I tell you what, that generation, unless they finally replace their doubt and unbelief that they had with those 12 spies that went to spy out the land and 10 of them that brought back a negative report, unless they changed from a place of doubt and unbelief to a place of faith, they would never have ever entered into the place of the land of milk and honey. They would have never had the faith to step into the River Jordan and have the Jordan part. Amen? And uh, that word receive, to receive that rest, uh, in the Greek, it's spudazo. It literally means to make effort, to be prompt or earnest, do diligence, be diligent, endeavor, labor. Now, in, in some versions, it says, let us then do our best to labor to enter into that rest. Now, that almost sounds like an oxymoron. How do you labor to enter into rest? But listen to me. You're doing your best effort through faith and through following Messiah to enter into the rest, the ceasing from me doing my own thing, me taking the rocks and saying, you know what? The Father said, don't put any iron tools, but I think I'll put iron tools to them anyway, because they'll look better. And we'll just add a little bit here and add a little bit there, and we sculpt it up, and we find that we've missed his rest because lack of faith, and faith works through obedience, guys. Faith without obedience is not faith. Dead. Is not faith. Amen. And that's where we are in America. People said they have faith, but there's no obedience to a lot of anything in their life. So again, instead of cursing the darkness, let's join the story. Let's make a difference. Amen. Amen. All right, wrapping it up. Y'all come on around the table here.